I'm going to uh, now move on to uh, introducing one of our two keynote, keynote speakers, and it's with great pleasure that, that I uh, will be bringing back up to the stage Dr. Peter Lin. Uh, you guys will remember uh, Dr. Lin uh, spoke to us last year, and he was such a phenomenal success. There was a huge uh, request to bring him back, and it's with great pleasure that I bring Peter back. Uh, Peter is a, an exceptional uh, uh, friend. We've known each other now for a few years. We've worked on a number of projects together, both here in town and, and, and on research studies and uh, educational initiatives. And Peter is an exceptional uh, f clinician. He's an exceptional physician. He is well known both nationally and internationally. He, I keep referring, him, referring to him as uh, Canada's own Dr. Oz. He doesn't like me calling him Dr. Oz, but you know, uh, he, he is one of our celebrity physicians in the country, and as opposed to other celebrity physicians where I get a little concerned about some of the advice that Oz might give uh, about pomegranate extract and how it will grow my hair back, uh, I've tried it, it really doesn't work, so uh, I'm going to ask for my money back from, from Dr. Oz on the pomegranate extract for my hair. Um, but, you know, Peter is, is both an excellent clinician He's an excellent speaker, but he's also a scientist. So he, you know, that's the, 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 the beauty of it, is that he's able to bring together true hardcore science that teaches us how we can truly you know, follow uh, healthy lifestyles and how we can prevent disease, but not you know, uh, ignore the fact that there are so many things that we can do as individuals. And you know, uh, Peter has a huge, huge CV, so I'm not going to uh, take up the rest of the day uh, going through his 350-page uh, CV. But briefly, you know, Peter started his studies in the Faculty of Science and Engineering, so he's de destined to be an engineer at the University of Toronto. But midway through, he woke up and realized the light and switched over to the Faculty of Medicine, and, and he's completed his studies uh, through the University of Toronto system. Uh, but because of his uh, you know, engineering background, that I think really speaks to his analytic mind. He really kind of looks at things in a very precise manner, as many engineers do. And that has also led him to be involved in various research projects, some of which we've worked with it together. And over the years, it's really become apparent to many of us that he, he has a wide chasm of interests, both clinical and research. Um, both in primary care and in specialized medicine, helping to bridge uh, the gap between science, education, and day-to-day uh, -day healthcare. And you know, he's spoken at many venues. He spoke to us, as I said, last year. But he's a well-respected, well-known uh, medical educator uh, in the country. He served in the past as the medical director at the University of Toronto's Health and Wellness Center. Um, he's the director of primary care initiatives at the Canadian Heart Research Center, and he is a lecturer, lecturing not just across the country, but around the world in Saudi Arabia, Gulf states, the US, Europe, Egypt, South Africa, the Philippines, Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, Vietnam, Costa Rica. I want his aeroplan card, because that guy must own Air Canada by now, the amount of flights he's been on. So I think they're, they're giving him a, a plane for himself now. So with, with great, great pleasure, I ask uh, Dr. Lin to come up and address us. Uh, I'm really looking forward to Peter's uh, talk today. Peter. Thanks very much, Dr. Pandey. And before I get started, I think we should give a huge round of applause to Dr. Pandey, Michelle Pandey, the whole family, and their organization uh, for doing this work every single year. I'm trying to somehow convince him to bring this to Toronto and to other cities, and he said, no, that's too much work because we're very stubborn. Uh, but perhaps uh, if we had more of these kind of events, as what he's put together, um, cardiovascular disease would uh, be reduced uh, significantly. Anyway, so thank you all very much. And I, and I just, you know, talking about travels, I just got back from Vietnam. So if I screw up the slides, it's because I'm jet lagged or something like that. But um, so uh, in Vietnam, there's a translator. So there's always a translator there in your head. Uh, and I was talking to one of the uh, neurologists there, and he was telling me his first uh, time that he used a translator about two years ago in Japan. And he wanted to tell a joke about the US president, but he wasn't sure if the Japanese would kind of get the American humor, right? They're very strict, and they sit there, they, you know, they smile, not, they don't smile, and then they leave. Um, so so, um, so um, he got up there, and he, he blurted out his joke. And thankfully, people laughed, and he felt good, and he went on with his lecture. And then at night, he was sitting with the chairman, and he was talking to the chairman. He said, you know what? I was so glad that the Japanese kind of got the American humor. I wasn't sure if it would work out. 
And the chairman leaned back over and he said, actually, the translator said, I don't know what he's trying to say. I think he's trying to tell a joke. Please laugh, okay? So, <laughs> so <laughs> said I, <laughs> he wishes his, he had that translator all the time, you know, nowadays. So. Anyway, so, so what I'm going to do today is that I, I, I'm sorry I missed the uh, dietitian's talk because I, I wanted to learn a whole lot of things and I heard that she gave you all sorts of different choices and stuff. So I am going to talk a little bit about diet because there are some things that we can do. Um, so I, I apologize if we do overlap a little bit in that area. So first I, started, I thought I'd start off with this funny one. So this is David. Okay, so David uh, has uh, been loaned to the United States to make some money for Italy because of the bad economy. So David has been living in the United States for about two years and now he's going back to Italy. But unfortunately, David looks like this now when he goes back to Italy. <laughs> so this is a bit of a problem, I think. Yeah. But he's got lots of good sponsors. <laughs> so... We kind of know that obesity is the driving cause of many of the heart disease and diabetes. So in Saudi Arabia, I think about 50% of the people have obesity, like by definition, and about 25% of them have diabetes. So we kind of know that it's a, it's a driving force, but unfortunately we don't do a whole lot about it. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the things that we can do along the way. I don't know why they all have chest pain, but they all have chest pain for some reason. <laughs> So it all began because of heart disease, right? Because back in the 1940s and 50s, we didn't really know why people had heart attacks. So there was a little study that they set up called the Framingham Heart Study. And they said, you know, we're gonna study 5,000 people. Um, and this was after the Second World War. So they were trying to wonder why people were still dying, you know, even though the war had been finished. Uh, and so they started to try and figure out what were the risk factors for heart attacks and things like that. And so they started looking at things like at autopsy, you would see stuff like this, right? You would see a cholesterol build up here, and then you would see a blood clot that was sitting here. So for a very long time, we always thought, you know, this is when you're born, you have beautiful arteries, and then what happens is that you eat all sorts of crazy fast foods and stuff like that, and you build up cholesterol in here, and this thing gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and then eventually it plugs up, and then you have a heart attack. But if that were true, then every single person should have some chest pain, you know, before they have the massive heart attack, because the pipe gets smaller and smaller, and then eventually you can't walk up hills because there's not enough blood flow going to your heart. But then what they were finding is that there were about 50% of the people that said, I didn't have any chest pain, and then they just showed up with a massive heart attack. So then very quickly, they realized that the, this plaque, this cholesterol, is soft, and occasionally this would rupture. And when it ruptures, then your body will treat this like a cut anywhere else. And when you cut yourself, the first thing you do, you try to stop the bleeding. So therefore, the platelets would come and stop the bleeding and then form a little platelet plug that would seal off that area. Now, if it's tiny, no big deal. You'll just grow this thing a little bit bigger. The plaque will get bigger. But if all of a sudden you make a big blood clot and it plugged up the whole pipe, you went from something that was maybe 20, 30% blocked, which you wouldn't feel at all, to something that would plug up the whole pipe and then you would have this horrific heart attack and so on and so forth. And by understanding the single mechanism, people were able to say the way we should treat these people is we should somehow play with your platelets. In other words, make your blood a little thinner. So that's when aspirin became important and so on and so forth. And all of a sudden, we knew what to do in the emergency department. So when Dr. Pandy sees somebody like this, we can give them blood thinners and things like that to try and break up this clot. Or now we can pass in a little tube, and you've seen this on all Discovery Channel, you pass in the tube, you blow up the balloon, and you can actually unclog these things and then put a little metal mesh there, and that's what we call a stent, and then we can keep that area open so that it doesn't clog up in this fashion again. So just by understanding this one picture, it allowed us to prevent some of the heart attacks and also to treat some of the heart disease as well. But then that begged the question, what created all of this stuff to begin with? This is kind of like looking afterwards when there's rust all over the car. And so therefore the thought is, how do we find the factors that are actually causing this disease to begin with? So the Framingham Heart Study started in 1948. Uh, they studied 5,000 people in the town of Framingham, just outside Boston. And 12 years later, they reported that smoking was somehow related to heart disease. All they did was they just measured everything about these people and then just counted heart attacks and strokes. A year later, they reported blood pressure is bad, cholesterol is bad for you. And then a bunch of years later, five or six years, obesity is bad for you. And perhaps obesity is causing blood pressure and cholesterol. And then diabetes became important as being another risk factor as sugar would stick all over inside your body and cause problems that way as well. And obesity seems to drive diabetes. So now you've got obesity driving this one and this one and perhaps this one as well. Then they figured out that four years later, 
if you're stressed out, if you're depressed, if you have psychological uh, problems, that would increase your risk as well. And then finally, in 1981, they said maybe what you eat might have something to do with things as well. And then after 50 years, they had enough numbers that they can make the first equation. The, the, the math equation is about this long, where they can calculate your risk of having a heart attack or stroke based on your blood pressure, your cholesterol, diabetes, smoking, all those things that they had figured out. So it took them 50 years to have enough numbers that they can say your blood pressure is worth this many risk factor points and things like that. So when your family doctor or your specialist does a Framingham risk calculation, that's what they're calculating. What is your future risk of having a heart attack in the next 10 years? If it's high, then we're gonna be very aggressive with you. If you are close to the cliff, then what I'm gonna do is give you lots of medications and I might have to do surgeries and stuff like that so that I can get you away from that cliff of having a heart attack or stroke. Uh, if you are far away from the heart attack or stroke cliff, like let's say you're 15 years old, then it's lifestyle. We need to focus on what you're eating and exercise. So lifestyle is very important no matter what age you are, but the closer you are to the cliff, the more medications we have to kick in, unfortunately. So therefore, the earlier we start, the better in terms of lifestyle and those kind of changes along the way. This is what a nine-year-old child's aorta, that's the big pipe that goes down into their belly, looks like. So this child died of a car accident, unfortunately, so they cut open the aorta this way, and here's the little blood vessels to go into your spine to give blood to your spinal cord. And you can see this is really smooth, like it, it looks good. The lining of the pipe looks very good. And, but you can see here, there's already yellow stuff depositing. So even in a nine-year-old child, there's already fat depositing. So when we talk about disease of the pipes, atherosclerosis, in other words, those cholesterol things building up, it's already starting in childhood here, and then it continues to march along for 30 years, and then you have a heart attack when you're 40 or 50. The good news is that we have time, because this disease process takes a long time, which means we can access that time. So if you haven't had a heart attack yet, it means that we can do something now to prevent that very first heart attack from occurring. Now, some patients are not so nice looking here. They look like this. This is sort of messed up, eh? So this is, uh, you know, obviously the patients didn't do well because this is the autopsy. So therefore, this is a problem. Um, so you can see that this is an adult aorta that doesn't look too bad, but it certainly doesn't look like that nine-year-old child. This is full of cholesterol. There's some more cholesterol in this one, but you can see the blood pressure would hit it and tear up the lining. So therefore, you get damage this way. You get a little hole here. Actually, your, your platelets, remember those sticky things that want to stop you from bleeding, will stick to those places. So that's why patients like this need to take cholesterol medicines, blood pressure medicines, and things that will make their blood a bit thinner. And that's why they have to go on to all of these medications, because the blood vessels are not very healthy looking in that fashion. And then if you think about those blood vessels, it's all over your body. So this is you without any organs, okay? This is you without a brain or a heart. I know you think of some of your relatives as having no brain, but this is a different idea, <laughs> okay? So. so if you understand that the blood vessels are the ones that are being damaged, then if I damage the ones going to the head, then I'm at risk of stroke, right? If I don't get enough blood to the brain, then the brain will have a stroke. If I don't get enough blood to the heart, then you have a heart attack. If I don't get enough blood to your kidneys, then your kidneys will suffer. And then if I don't get enough blood to your feet, then your toes will suffer. So some people will complain about cramps when they're walking, or perhaps their um, toes get very cold in the wintertime, or in some cases, they get sores, little cuts, and they don't heal. And you sort of have these non-healing things down below because I can't get blood flow going into your legs. So that same process that's attacking all the blood vessels will affect your brain, your heart, your kidneys, and also your legs. So that's why we want to treat this disease as early as we can and try to remove it so that we protect all of those organs along the way. Oh, this guy's heading there really fast. So these are the things that speed it up for you. So um, genetics, so your family history. So if you, if, let's say your parents uh, had heart disease early. In other words, a man less than 55 having a heart attack or stroke, or a woman less than 65 having a heart attack or stroke, that's too soon. So that would mean that that would be a family history, that there's something uh, funny going on. Um, in terms of age, so let's say as you get older, the disease will continue to damage the pipe. So the older you are, the higher the risk. And then sex, that's not having sex, right? Everybody thinks, you know, hey, I have lots of sex, so we're good. So this is being male or female. So it is not fair for the guys. The men will have this disease much earlier as well. These are things that I can't fix. I, I mean, you could have a sex change, but I don't think it affects the risk uh, in this particular fashion. Um, now, 
these are the things that you can fix, right? So you and your doctor and your pharmacist and the nurses uh, could help you with your blood pressure, help you with cholesterol, help you with diabetes. So as a team, you can work on those three things very nicely. And then these are just all you. In other words, diets, exercise, smoking, and stress. Those are things that you're under complete control. So therefore, you'll get some help from your doctors and your nurses, but then basically it's you having to do all those things along the way. And so we're going to talk more about that side of things. I think Dr. O will talk more about you know, the things that we can do as a, as a community, as doctors for you. Has anybody been on a cruise? Ah, rich people. That's nice. OK, I like that. OK. So we, we finally went on a cruise. Everybody said it's so good, so good. So we finally went on a cruise, and, and we, we're cheap, right? So you know how the higher up you are, that costs more, right? So we were so low, the crew was saying goodnight to us, OK? We were below them, OK? So, goodnight, so. so anyway, so we finally went on a cruise. Did anybody find any food on a ship? Did you find some food on the ship? Yeah, you found some food? So this is me after a week of uh, cruising. <laughs> So this was a problem, right? All you can eat everything. So we ate and ate and ate. And so we were eating like, I don't know, 5,000 calories every single meal. And then what do you do? You just sit around, right? For most of the cruise, you sit around. So, so it's a good way to gain weight if you'd like to go on one of those cruises. And we surveyed women uh, about men, okay? So this is a good survey for all of the ladies, okay? So we asked women about men, and this is what they said. Uh, what we're looking for and what's looking for us, okay? So, <laughs> so <laughs> we've got a bit of a problem there, you know? And interestingly, my office is full of these people, okay? So I'm not sure why. You know, so somehow the big belly and the hair comes from here and goes here. I'm not sure how that happens. But, anyway. but you've seen this person and you recognize this person. We call them metabolic syndrome because they describe a particular feature. They have a big belly. Um, their blood pressure tends to be a little bit high. Their sugar is a little bit off. Their cholesterol is a little bit off. And that person is at very high risk of heart disease. You've heard Dr. Oz talks about the toxic fat. So the toxic fat is the fat not underneath your skin. So this, the love handles that you pinch, that fat doesn't really do much. But the fat inside your belly produces a lot of hormones and things like that. And it makes your body not work so well. Think of it this way. You've got so much food going in there that your body cannot move the fat out. It just deposits it at the port. So the port around your bowel, that's where it deposits around your liver. So that's the fat that's kind of toxic. So that's why we keep saying we want the belly size to go down, and that way we know that we're getting rid of the bad fat inside your body. Ah, tortoise or the hare. So there was just an article that just came out, and I'm going to be talking about it tomorrow on CBC, about um, how much exercise you're going to do. Now, I know you heard a lot about exercise. This was only talking about, should I do the sprinting really fast one, or should I do 50 minutes of exercise? So they took 10 minutes where they just did 20 seconds of sprinting on a bike like really fast and then 20 seconds and then you just go like a minute and a half normal speed and then 20 seconds a minute and a half 20 seconds and then you just have the same warm down and cool up down cycle so all of that took 10 minutes and those people did roughly the same as somebody that exercised for 50 minutes in terms of their heart health their breathing ability and when they biopsied their muscles and looked at the cells the power plants in the muscle cells were increased by the same way in both of them so therefore, there may be some hope that for us lazy people, that we just need 10 minutes and we can get some of the benefit. But the people that exercise for 50 minutes, they lost more weight. So therefore, there's still benefit of doing that. So perhaps we should mix the two together. Let's start off with the 10 minute bursting kind of thing. And then what we do is then we go towards the 50 minute where we can get the other benefits. Now for those with bad knees or bad hearts with blocked arteries, please don't do this fast, 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 because it's bad on your joints and it's bad on your heart because all of a sudden you're asking your heart to do a lot of stuff at once. So for those types of patients, let us not do that. Let's do the gentle way and do it nice and slow and build yourself up that way. Ah, your food. So you've, you've seen food changes, right? So the, the 1993 to 2013, you can see them increase. So the muffin has now increased from 85 grams in weight to 130. The bagel wasn't bad. They just increased a little bit and so on and so forth. And this is the chicken pie. And this all started with a very simple concept. And I, I don't want to blame anybody, but what happened was it was all about chocolate bars. So the chocolate bar industry wanted to sell more chocolate bars. But parents would never buy two chocolate bars. They would only buy one chocolate bar for their kid. So how do I increase my sales if you will not buy a second chocolate bar? What I do is make it a little bit bigger and then charge you a little bit more. 
So now all of a sudden, I, you're still buying one chocolate bar, but I've now made a little bit more money on you. And so that's what they did was they kept increasing the size and increasing the price, and therefore the company continued to make money and increasing their profitability. So it started with chocolate bars, but then it sort of applies to all of these things along the way. So now you can see that all of the things are supersizing. Now at some point, people said, I don't want to eat all that much anymore. So now how do I make money? What I do is I charge you the same amount, and I give you slightly smaller. All right, so now all of a sudden my profitability is again going good, right? So I've got you at $9, but then I'm gonna give you a smaller burger and so on and so forth. So maybe we'll control the obesity by you know, somehow the corporations wanting more money and then eventually your burger will be like a meatball or something like that. So we'll see whether that happens. But you can see that the plate sizes have changed. So back in the days, we were used to have in the 60s an eight and a half inch plate. Now we're up to a 12 inch plate. And if you do the math, you know how you do the area and the pie and all that kind of stuff, which I've forgotten already, you could see that you can increase the amount of food that you're carrying, let's say 30 or 40% on that plate. Now, if you wanna get smart, you can get smaller plates, right? So therefore you can't put as much. And then second thing is maybe you can get plates with a rim. So if there's a raised rim, you tend to just fill the food in the middle and you don't go out to the edge. On the cruise that I was on, the, the plates were not round, they were oval to give you extra space. And the edges were walls, so you can build up a pile, <laughs> okay? So I was quite happy with that cruise. Now, <laughs> so you can see the difference, right? This is a large plate, this is a small plate. This is the exact same amount of food, but this one looks so pathetic, right? Right, if you were, you know, you'd slop on at least another two scoops on this one, and so automatically you ate more. Similarly, a tall glass looks like you're drinking more stuff than a wide short glass. So therefore, get a tall glass, fill it up with ice, and then you pour the soft drink in there, and then you're getting very little soft drink, but yet you still feel like you've had something good uh, along the way. McDonald's, we all heard about the McDonald's, the fries and the supersize and all that kind of stuff. They're trying to give you value, so now you're getting you know, three times the amount in your normal fries now. And so therefore, that might be a little bit excessive. And when they sort of have it in a happy meal or whatever, it's very happy, right, because you're happy with these things. Um, but then that's the problem. And then our eyes are saying, well, we want the larger products as well. And here's the Mars bars, the size differences as well. And you'll notice that it went up in the 1990s, and now it's coming back down and it's stabilizing because they're trying to make profit selling you a smaller bar as well. Um, this is the types of food that we're changing. So slowly, we're going from the greasy stuff, and now the demand is for oatmeal, okay? So therefore, all of these places are now trying to provide healthy things. So if we demand it, the companies, as long as they can make money at it, they will uh, go ahead and provide that service for you. So if we ask for it, um, they will come. Calories, oh, this is the dieting part, right? So my, my, I'm hoping the dietician will fix it. I was supposed to go ahead of her, and then she was supposed to fix all my mistakes in my talk, okay? So now we're backwards, okay. So you've heard everything, right? Fat is bad, sugar is bad, everything is bad, right? Basically, whatever, we used to tell our patients, if it tastes good, spit it out, okay? Because it's, <laughs> something's wrong with it, right? But in reality, we have to eat. The question is, can we be healthy about it? And there's a lot of fad diets that they want your money, right? They want you to buy their book or their food products. So we gotta be really careful when we're trying to lose weight that we're not doing some silly things along the way. So just to give you some basics, right? Carbohydrates, which is really sugars hooked together, okay? As a little choo-choo train, that's what a carbohydrate is. And our, our whole body burns glucose. So our whole body burns glucose, so you need sugar. So it's not that sugar is bad, but we need to burn uh, glucose. And so that will give you energy, okay? Protein, uh, you know, meat and stuff like that will give you amino acids to repair your muscles and a lot of these things called enzymes in your body that help keep the chemical processes going. So there's a lot of need to replace those things. So let's say I'm running, I'm going to damage my muscle, I need protein to replace the muscle and things like that. Fat is fantastic. It's a very good storage medium. I'll show you a slide later, but one gram of fat, one gram of fat stores nine calories. So it's like a little energizer bunny, whereas one gram of protein only stores four calories. One gram of carbohydrate, only four calories. Alcohol is not bad. One gram of alcohol is seven calories. So my patients always say, I'm storing energy. This is a good thing. So, so think of fat as the perfect medium to carry energy with you. So if you're gonna go in the desert and there's no food, I wanna carry fat with me because for every gram of weight, I can get nine calories of energy out from that. So therefore, that's why it's very good. So that's why when you have too much protein and you're not using it all up, it will be converted into fat as a storage medium. 
if you have too many carbohydrates coming in, it will convert it into fat, thinking that, oh, you had a good meal today, but chances are we're not going to get another antelope for another week, so therefore we need to smooth you out. They haven't heard of, you know, pizza, pizza, 967, 1111, and you can call it into you, you know? So therefore the thought is that if you're hunting, you're not going to be eating every single day, so we need to smooth that out, and so the fat is the smoothing out of that, uh, of that area. The problem now with our diet is that you eat too many carbs, you don't burn much, we sit around a lot, so then you don't need much energy. We're not running around, so you don't need to repair your muscles, but we're eating a lot of protein, right? We're eating these big steaks and stuff like that. So you actually have excesses of this, excesses of this, and fat tastes good, okay? So fat, when it's on the back of your tongue, tastes very good. So then we have more fat that we're eating as well. So you're actually eating more of everything. So that's why any diet works. So if they say cut out your carbs, it'll work because you're eating too much, and if you cut it out, you will lose some weight. If you're eating too much fat, they say cut out all the fat, you're gonna lose some weight. The only one that you cannot cut out completely is protein because we cannot make a lot of the amino acids. There are some that are called essential. You have to have them, otherwise you will die. So therefore, we have to eat that in. So that's why most of the diets will leave the protein alone. And then they know that you like protein. They say, this is the all meat and bacon diet. And all the guys go, awesome, that's my diet, okay? The problem with that is that it's very hard to just eat protein. It's very hard on your stomach and things like that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So you got three knobs, so any knob will work. But the question is, can you stay on that diet? My, my sister, I remember way back, was on the all cheese diet, okay? We didn't want to get 10 feet near her. She was so constipated and farty, you know, like along the way, right? So you still. Now, what are the chances that you can stay on an all cheese diet for the rest of your life? The answer is zero, right? So any diet that you cannot see yourself staying on for 10 years, that is not a good diet for you. That's a fad. That's just going to work for a little bit, and then it's going to be gone. Oh, here, Yoda, fat leads to the dark side. So let me just take you through some of the things that we had. So fat is bad for you, and here's the big deal. Butter is bad for you. They said butter is bad, oil is good. Uh, and so the reason why we have butter, and this is solid at room temperature, this is liquid. Why is that? Because of this. So saturated fat, that's what it looks like. Saturated just means that every carbon is holding hands with one other person, okay? They're not doing double hand holds. They're just doing single hand holds all the way across. And you'll notice this thing is very straight. So if you have them very straight and I stack them on top of each other, they will stick very nicely. And at room temperature, they will be a solid. So that's why butter is saturated fat because you can stack them on top. Unsaturated fat looks like this. This guy's not holding single hands. He's holding double hands with this carbon. And you'll notice this thing is bent because these two hydrogens push against each other, they don't like each other, and there's nobody to push back on this side, so this thing gets bent. And because it's bent, I cannot stack these things very nicely, so that's why at room temperature, it's an oil, okay? So can't stack them, becomes an oil. I can stack them, it becomes solid, okay? Now here's the problem, though. Uh, I wanna make a cookie. But to make the cookie, I cannot put oil in the cookie because the cookie will just fall apart. I need something at room temperature that's solid so I can mix it in with my cookie. So then people very smart back then said, okay, this is bad for you because it clogs up your heart and all that stuff. So we need to find something that can stack, but that will not be that thing up there. So what happened was, it turns out that double bond thing, the hydrogen can either be on the same side, in which case it'll bend, or the hydrogen can be on opposite sides, in which case they don't push each other, so this thing is straight. And this became known as trans fat because the hydrogens are opposite from each other. So therefore, it's straight. That's awesome, right? If it's straight, I can stack them together and it'll be solid at room temperature. That's what Crisco is, okay? So Crisco is solid at room temperature. I can put it into my cookie, it won't fall apart, and I can bake you beautiful cookies without the bad saturated fat that's in butter. So then people thought this was a great plan along the way. So just to give you an idea, this is the bent guy. That's oil, that's okay. And this is the trans fat, which is straight along here, okay? Problem is, we created this man-made. It's kind of man-made. So nature doesn't know what to do with it. So the bacteria look at this and go, what do you want me to do with this? I don't know how to break it down. In fact, they don't know what to do with it to the point where you can keep Crisco outside the fridge and the bacteria will not eat it. It does not go bad because the bacteria look at it and go, I don't want that stuff, okay, because I don't know what to do with it, okay? How do I break it down, okay? So it can last for a year on your shelf and not go bad. And so therefore, this became fantastic for cooking and baking and all that kind of stuff. But the problem is in your body, your body doesn't know what to do with it, so it stays in your body for longer. It'll stack together just like the saturated fat and plug up your coronaries. In fact, a little bit worse because your body doesn't know how to get rid of it. And so that's why now you're seeing people saying, we're gonna take the trans fats out of the foods um, that we're having right now. 
omega-3 fatty acids, the only thing that they're describing is the position of that double hand holding. So omega-3 fatty acids have it in position three. There's omega-6 and nine. Now, I'm a cheap Chinese guy, right? So I go to Costco, right? And I'm trying to buy omega stuff, right? So there's one that says omega-3, 6, and 9. I'm going to buy it all, okay? <laughs> it turned out 6s and 9s are in burnt food. Like when you deep fry stuff and things like that, 6s and 9s, we get too many of 6s and 9s. And 6s and 9s are kind of bad on your system. 3s aren't bad, so what you want is the 3, but you don't want the 6s and 9s. And in all the studies, when we try to give you a little capsule of omega-3 and try and save your life, it doesn't work. Because what happens is you're still eating the sixes and nines, and I give you this tiny little capsule of omega-3, and it's not going to work, or that egg that has omega-3, and it's not going to balance out. In all the studies where it works, like the Eskimos and things like that, they ate foods high in omega-3, which meant they did not eat foods that were high in sixes and nines. They didn't eat the deep-fried foods and the meats and all that kind of stuff. So the reason why omega-3 works in those diet studies is because if they're eating fish, they're not eating deep fried blah, 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 blah. And that was probably why it works. So if you like the omega-3 story, you can take omega-3, don't take the sixes and nines, but change it in your diet. You know, eat the fish and all that kind of stuff along the way. And then now they tell us you shouldn't eat too much fish because there's mercury in it and then you'll die from that, so not more than twice a week. I mean, eventually we will just eat nothing and we'll just stare at each other along the way. Then we went on to the sugar was poison, right? Remember sugar is poison, right? So therefore sugar is poison and they show you all the sugar cubes that are in all these drinks. And liquid sugar is very popular, so pop is very popular. It doesn't fill you up, you don't think you had a meal, but then you're getting a lot of sugar intake as well. Then patients started saying, okay, you told me to eat fruit, so I start juicing it, right? So now when you juice a fruit, you get all the sugar. Some of the machines take out the fiber. So now you're in trouble, you just get the sugar. And one apple is not enough, so I juice three apples. So now I have the sugar from three apples instead of just eating one apple. So if you're gonna do fruit, just eat the fruit with the fiber and with everything else in it. Don't juice. Juicing is very good for people that can't absorb well. Looking at you guys, you are absorbing quite well, you know, like, <laughs> so you're okay. <laughs> so you're okay. Then the fructose, high, corn, uh, high fructose corn syrup. So here's a problem. There was a, a bit of an, a political problem where the United States couldn't get corn sugar. So sugar cane they couldn't get from the countries because there was problems. And so therefore they needed a way to sweeten their food. And they noticed that they'd grow a lot of corn and the corn has fructose inside that corn uh, kernel. So then if they took out the fructose, fructose is much sweeter on your tongue. So therefore your normal table sugar is one glucose and one fructose together, so 50-50. So what they realize, if I can concentrate it so it's more fructose, then I can make it sweeter and I can use it as an artificial sweetener or, or a sweetener into your food. So that's why high fructose corn syrup became the sweetener of choice. The only problem is that fructose cannot be processed by anybody else except your liver. So your body burns glucose, every cell burns glucose, but fructose can only burn, be burnt in the liver. So when the liver burns the fructose and it has all this extra energy, it stores it as fat, and that might increase fatty liver, like the fat deposit in there. So the more fructose we have, the more trouble we have getting rid of it because only the liver can actually burn it off. So therefore, we can cut down on the fructose. That might be a good thing as well. This is glycemic index. This is just how fast the sugar gets into your body. So when you eat a chocolate bar, for example, the sugar is simple sugars. It's just glucose and fructose. So your body cuts it in half and the sugars come right into your body. If I eat pasta, uh, starch, sugar is like a long choo-choo train. So in other words, glucose, 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 they're all hooked together. And when I absorb that, I have to cut one sugar and then cut another sugar and cut another sugar. So it slows down the sugar coming into the system. So therefore your pancreas, which is making insulin to handle your sugar, doesn't have to work as hard. So therefore, the slower the sugar comes in, then your pancreas has a nice, easy job as opposed to a big flood of sugar coming in. So if you look up these things, the low glycemic index products are the things that you want to eat so that you're reducing your risk of diabetes and those kinds of things. Ah, brand. So I never knew this, but th this is your wheat stuff, right? So here's the brand. The brand has all those nice vitamins on the outside. Um, and then this is the germ. This is the thing that will grow into another wheat plant. And this is endosperm. I don't like that word as being a food product for me. So what is white bread made from? Wheat, but of those three things, what is it made from? Is it the outside part? Is it the germ? Or is it endosperm? Yeah, you guessed it, it's endosperm. You're eating endosperm, you can tell your kids that. Anyway, so, <laughs> so the way we do it, we take the kernel and then we break it all up, and then what we do is we take the endosperm, and that's what goes and becomes white bread. 
So you're missing the minerals, you're missing all the other good stuff along the way. You're just getting the starches along the way. And the endosperm is just there to keep the germ alive. It's food for this guy, okay? So basically with multigrain, they've sort of repositioned them all back together again so that you're not just getting a piece of it, you're actually getting all of it back together again. So probably that's why they say whole grains is good, meaning don't eat parts of it, eat the whole thing. And that way you'll have a better benefit out of it. Oh, meat. Yeah, everybody's getting hungry right about now, right? So anyway, so, so what about protein and things like that? Um, it turns out that if you go on an all-protein diet, let's say you just ate protein, how do you live? Because your body burns glucose. This is a very complicated way where proteins, amino acids, the stuff in green are the different types of amino acids that you get when you're eating. It has to actually be converted into glucose. So the way it goes is that it has to come down either through this cycle or come straight here and make this guy, and this guy becomes glucose. So therefore, that's why when people go on an all-protein diet where they say, I'm not eating any carbs at all, the first thing they'll say is, I feel really dizzy. I don't feel good, I have no energy. That's because they can't convert the protein into sugar or glucose, which is what the body needs to burn. So all of a sudden, there's no energy, and that's why people slow down. So if you're going to try one of these all-protein diets, in the beginning, you still need some carbs. Otherwise, you're going to go dizzy, and you're going to feel horrible along the way, okay? And so therefore, once your body starts converting, you will convert the amino acids into protein. The problem is, is that if you eat a lot of protein, you get a lot of waste products called ammonia. And ammonia has to go through your kidneys to leave your body. So now we've sort of overloaded your kidneys a little bit with extra workload. So that's why we don't like diets where we just swing you all to one product and ignore some of the other things along the way. Your amino acids look like this. The top part looks the same, okay? The tail is different for each one of these types of amino acids, and we have lots of amino acids. And the way we make proteins, like how do we make your muscle, we actually hook up these amino acids together like a necklace. So we hook them all up, and then what happens is that once we hook them all up, these are all the different types of amino acids that we can hook up. These ones are essential, meaning you can't make it. You have to you know, uh, uh, actually eat that stuff in. And so what happens is the following, is that we hook them all up like this on a chain, Okay, and remember the long, some of them are long, some of them are short, some of them push against each other, some of them stick to each other. So once I make the chain and I let go, that chain will fold because those dangling tails would either push against each other or want to be together and it folds up. And it turns out that proteins need to be folded properly for them to work. Turns out, for example, for the processes to work, these enzymes to work, the proteins have to be folded in a certain shape, kind of like a pair of scissors, I guess, if you will. And so therefore, once it's folded in the right shape, it'll cut things at the right places, and it allows your body to perform normally. What happens if you're missing some of those essential amino acids because you're not eating well? So now, all of a sudden, when I'm making the necklace, I'm looking for this one, and there's no, none of that one to put in the necklace. So then I'll substitute something else. But if I substitute something else, the tail might not be the right length. It might not stick and push the right way. So then the folding will be abnormal. And so therefore the protein cannot function normally and you have breakdown of systems. So could this explain why the elderly have continuing damage that doesn't repair? So the joints get worse and worse and worse because they cannot make the proteins properly. Could this explain Alzheimer's disease where you have stuff building up in the head, garbage building up, and in young people you don't get that garbage. So we just have to look at your nutrition and make sure that you're balanced out so that you're not making substitutions when you're making these protein chains along the way. So that's why we tell people, our dietitians always say divide things up into quarters, so therefore you have the right foods along the way, and so therefore make sure that you eat everything. So a diet that includes all of the products is a good diet. A diet that just says eat cheese only, you can pass on those ones because it'll last for about a week and then it'll be gone. So that's why you have all these fad diets. I wanted to go through a couple of quick fad diets with you. Cotton ball diet, okay, so this is where they eat cotton balls. You can't digest it, so you feel full. Please don't do that, because they get stuck, okay? And then you got cotton coming out of your rear end. That's kind of weird. Um, but I guess you save on toilet paper. You just wipe with the cotton ball. <laughs> cabbage soup diet, there's a good one, right? If you want to fart all day, cabbage soup diet is a good one. So cabbage soup diet, they give you these fancy seven day things. And you know what, if I'm eating hamburgers all day long and then all of a sudden I switch to cabbage soup, I'm gonna lose weight because I'm not eating a million hamburgers anymore, right? So you will lose weight. Can you live on cabbage soup diet forever? That might be hard, right? So always think, can I use this thing for a long time? Grapefruit diet, it's good. Eh? Every time I eat grapefruit, I perspire. So I think I'm burning some calories or something like that. But you know how the grapefruit diet works? It's because of this. 
the diet is actually only 1,000 calories. So you eat the grapefruit, but then you're not allowed to eat more than 1,000. I think it's the 1,000 calories that makes you lose the weight, right? Because most of us will eat two or 3,000 calories along the way. Uh, what about, oh, this is the five-bite diet. Okay, so you just take five bites. And <laughs> could you imagine your parents wasting food, okay? <laughs> eat the whole thing. So this is portion control. So you can do that. You don't have to do the five-bite diet, half a sandwich three quarters of a sandwich, cut a steak so you keep a strip for somebody else. So it's like, a, you know, when you got a raise, you, you felt the good money for a couple of weeks and then you don't feel anything. The reverse is true. If I cut away a little bit of food, you won't feel it, right? So I cut a little bit away, a little bit more, a little bit more. Smaller plates, that's another way to do this as well. The raw food diet, at first it made sense, right? Go back to the caveman days of eating raw food. But the problem is, is that we became very smart because we cooked our food as well. So by cooking food at low temperatures, you release some of the nutrients so that our body can get it. Whereas when you eat all raw stuff, you'd have no ability to get the stuff inside. So therefore, cooking it might have released chemicals that we can then use for our brain and things like that. And there's some people that believe that that's why we're smarter than other animals, because no other animal sits by a campfire and cooks their food, right? So therefore, by cooking it, we were breaking down the food so that we can absorb some of the nutrients which allowed our brain to grow and so on and so forth. So therefore, pure raw food may not be such a great idea because we do need some cooking along the way. Um, this is eat right for your blood type. Have you heard of that one, right? You've heard of that one. So if you're a type O, then you're a hunter, so you should eat protein, right? If you're a group A, then you're a, you're a cultivator, so therefore you're a vegetarian. And then if you're a B, then your, your immune system is good, so you can drink milk. I don't know what that has to do with anything, but, and then if you're AB, you're awesome, you can do whatever you want, okay? So, I mean, there's no rationale to that, right? So every person needs a certain amount of protein, certain amount of carbs, like, I mean, all of them will need the same amount. So therefore it made a splashy headline, and if I'm eating burgers and then I stop and I eat vegetarian, I'm gonna lose weight. And I'm gonna say, wow, the book really worked. Well, it wasn't that it really worked. I stopped eating burgers and I started eating vegetables. It's not because of my blood type. Hollywood diet, that was a good one. They got involved in that. So um, they sell you cookies, the Hollywood cookie diet. Right, that sounds really good. I like cookies and this is a cookie diet. So imagine if I go from burgers to just eating a cookie, now my calories went down and then the diet works. When I stop eating the cookies and I start eating the burgers, my weight goes up. So then I'll say, I gotta keep buying the cookies. So now you're hooked in and you gotta keep buying their product because you feel that that's the one that's making you lose the weight. Beyonce, whatever she's taking, I want. No, no, just kidding. Um, so, so she, at one point, was doing this thing. It was the lemonade uh, thing. Okay, so she's actually on their website, and it was a weird lemonade drink, so it's lemonade and cayenne peppers and stuff like that mixed together, and you drink that, and that made you lose weight. They didn't talk about the fact that she like performs nine billion hours, and she practices like a maniac and sweats like a maniac, and she probably doesn't eat a whole lot of food, right? So therefore, is it really the lemonade that's doing it, or the other parts of her, her lifestyle? Oh, the zone, <laughs> I like this, I'm in the zone. <laughs> okay. The zone isn't bad, okay? So the zone sort of talked about, you know, the, there's the book for the zone. Uh, basically, it said, you know, you should have about 40% carb, 30% protein, 30% fat. But that's very hard, right? If I said, how much did you eat just uh, at breakfast? I don't know, right? So you'd have to look up labels and stuff like that. So there's a lot of label looking, and they do have some recipes and, and certain uh, menus that you're supposed to follow. So again, if I go from five burgers a day down to the zone diet, it'll work because I'm getting rid of the burgers along the way. Dean Ornish, you know, very popular. So they have their diets and stuff like that along the way. And they sort of group things into group one is fruits and vegetables. Group two is plant, three is seafood, four is higher fat animal uh, product, and then group five is bad fat. So they tell you eat more of one, two, and three, and less of four and five. But it's the same thing, right? But they just grouped it so it sounds like something different. But it's the same story over and over again as well. South Beach, Miami. I, I thought the diet was where you go to Miami and then you, you lose weight, um, but apparently not. Um, so basically this was, and, and the key thing is that he's a doctor. He's a doctor, so therefore it must be correct. And actually this one isn't bad. It talks about good carbs versus bad carbs. You know, the fast sugars that come in and the slow sugars that come in, and then the good fat versus the bad fat, you know, the saturated, unsaturated, that kind of thing. So basically they just made fancy titles for the same thing that we just talked about. So fundamentally it's always the same kind of concept, right? Don't eat so much stuff, don't eat so much bad stuff, and exercise, right? Like if you think about all of them will boil down into that. And this is an example of the DASH diet, which helps you lower blood pressure. And the reason is because the sodium, they actually keep the salt content to a fairly low amount. So therefore, salt is another thing that you'd like to reduce as well, including fat and sugars as well. The paleo diet, the Flintstones diet, right? So this is the, the caveman diet, right? Everybody said it's good, and, and basically, 
you know, we're sort of like doing this, right? So we're trying to, <laughs> so, uh, so we're trying to, uh, you know, do the reverse and say, go be him. But if you want to go be him, go do activities like him. Because the diet that you're going to eat is a lot of meat and stuff like that, so therefore you need to burn calories and so on and so forth. So here's an example of breakfast, lunch, and stuff like that. But look at this, a buffalo strip steak with veggies and bacon, right? Any guy looking at that says, that's my diet, I'm caveman. But then what did caveman do? He was a hunter, right? So he was running all the time, he was moving around, he was using his muscles and things like that. If you're not a hunter and you eat huge amounts of meat, you're going to have extra muscle and protein left over, and you're going to convert it into fat. So if you're going to do the paleo diet, be paleo-like, okay, in terms of the activity. Now, don't drag women around by their hair and stuff like that, okay, like we don't need that kind of stuff. But the idea of paleo diet, what is not in a paleo diet is anything processed. So really it was saying try and avoid processed foods. So if you look at this side, it's all pretty naturally kind of looking things, right? But I would still cook it. Now when you're cooking things, no high temperature cooking, okay? So when we do high temperature cooking, there are some experts that think we put in all this energy and the me molecules clash and they make new molecules. And some of those new molecules may not be so healthy for you. Whereas low temperature cooking, simmering, stewing, that doesn't cause these high temperature chemicals. So maybe stewing and stuff like that is not a bad idea. This is the, uh, the government in the United States talking about their guidelines in terms of uh, diet. And they, they said something interesting. Every year they have a target, uh, like lower fat or lower sugar. This time they said the following. They said lower sugar, salt, and fat. So they targeted all three. And why? Because sugar, my whole body, I just said, burns on glucose. So when my brain sees that I've found sugar, I will keep eating that fuel source because I need to stay alive. That's a very primitive circuit. It's somewhere down here in the bottom of your brain. So basically, if you find sugar, you will keep eating it because then you will stay alive. Salt, we need to keep sh uh, water in our blood. So to keep our blood pressure up, we need salt to hold on to the water. And when we left the oceans where there was lots of salt, we needed to find sources of salt. So therefore, when you find a source of salt, you will keep eating that because that will keep your blood pressure and keep you alive. So that's why when the chips came out, that, what's that, sugar and sweet chips? I thought this was the stupidest thing in the world. Why would I want to eat sweet and salty at the same time? So my wife bought a bag from Costco, and I opened it up, I finished the whole bag. <laughs> so my brain was just going, you're going to live forever, okay? This is fantastic, okay? You've got both things that you need along the way. So therefore, be very careful because that primitive driving, the food industry knows, right? I mean, they're not bad people. They just want to sell products, and they want to make you happy. And that makes you very happy, right? Your brain says that I'm going to keep staying alive. The fat component is simple. Let's go back to the one gram of fat and in terms of the calories and stuff like that. I don't know if that's the next slide. Here we go. So fats, you get nine calories. So if you're stressed out, what does your body think? Okay? It doesn't know that you have a meeting tomorrow with your boss. It doesn't know your kid's stupid or whatever, right? All it says is that you're going to war. You're going to go into battle, right? So stress in your body is just battle. It could be you didn't sleep. That's battle, okay? So now all of a sudden your body's going to battle. So what will your body look for? Fuel source. Right? I gotta carry fuel with me just in case I get into a desert and I gotta fight my way out. So then all of a sudden it looks for high calories, so therefore you'll gravitate towards fatty foods. So that's why people say when I'm stressed out, I just eat the most stupid things. I don't normally eat buffalo wing chickens and all that kind of stuff, but I'm looking at it and I want it. And that's because your body is preparing you for battle. So therefore, um, yelling and screaming at home is stressful. That makes you eat more of these weird stuff. Uh, sweet, salt, as well as fat. If you don't sleep well at night, your body thinks you're in battle because the only reason why you can't sleep is because there's danger, okay, along the way. Um, and then, so these are the things that you want to think about in addition to exercise and all that stuff uh, as being good things for you. Oh, I like this, I beat anorexia, so <laughs> I'm so proud of him, right? So I'm so proud of him. <laughs> Anyway, so he's Irish, so it's okay. Anyway, so this was very interesting, okay? I'll, I'm gonna finish up soon. I know I'm sucking up too much time. Um, so, so this was a very interesting study. It's about your bowel bacteria. So David Suzuki, Dr. Suzuki, actually did a special in the nature of things all about how your gut is affecting your weight. So it turns out, th this is a crazy experiment that they did. They had twins, okay? These twins, one was obese and one was lean, okay? Just happened that way. They found twins that were, one's fat and one's skinny. They took the poop from these people and they put it into a mouse. And these mice are special. They have no bacteria, okay? So they were born with no bacteria in them. So you can put any kind of bacteria you'd like in them. And their immune system won't kill it off. So their immune system is sort of messed up as well. So these are special mice. And what they found is that if you put in the skinny bacteria from the skinny uh, twin, 
the mouse's normal weight. If you put in the poop and then now it's the, from the fat one, you get a fat mouse. So which means that the bacteria are doing something to change the obesity rates. And it makes sense. We have 100 trillion bacteria in our bowel. Finally, a number bigger than our deficit. Okay, so finally we found something like that. So 100 trillion, okay, so 100 trillion bacteria. Um, and so therefore, they're there processing off our foods, right? So they may be breaking it down and getting rid of it or breaking it down and allowing us to absorb. So you can imagine that if I change the bacteria, maybe I absorb more, okay, or I absorb chemicals that aren't good. And so that's why they're studying this to see, does this cause disease? Does it cause obesity, diabetes, asthma? Kids that have certain bacteria are less likely to have asthma, but they had to have the bacteria in the first year of life. If they have these four specific bacteria, the risk of asthma is much lower. So now we're understanding the bowel. Now you understand why we're so nervous about antibiotics. You know, you've got a, maybe a cold, I don't know, here's some antibiotics. Now we kill off some of the good guys as well. Um, and that's why some people get diarrhea, right? Because the good guys are gone and then your bowels can't process and then you get diarrhea. And then 50% of the antibiotics that we use is in animals, right? So they give it as a thing to make them grow bigger. And so therefore they notice that if they feed antibiotics to animals, the chickens are larger and stuff like that. So therefore we're getting antibiotics through there as well. So therefore the concept is that if the bowel bacteria is so important, that may be why when you eat fiber, the bowel bacteria changes and then your whole system is better. Because a lot of people say when I eat fiber, everything is regulated, it's all good. But it might not just be that the fiber hangs on to water and all that kind of stuff. It may be the fiber allows different bacteria to grow. And because of those different bacteria, then you process things much better as we move forward. Ah, the two of them, right? So we really didn't want either one, right? We wanted a mixture. We wanted a combination of the two. So the combination, I found our prime minister that we wanted. We wanted the combination of the two. And it's like this. This is the combination of the two. <laughs> Right? That's perfect, right? So, you know, he could take on Putin and look good at the same time, you see? So, what about combining all of these things? So, can we put it all together in some sort of neat package at the end here? Um, the Blue Zone people, and you've heard me talk about the Blue Zone people last time. So, these are areas in the world where people live to 100 past 100 by at least 10 times the normal rate. So, there's 10 times more people over the age of 100. And they're all over the place. So, some in California, Costa Rica, Italy, Greece, uh, Japan. So, they're not related genetically. So, in other words, they're separate from each other. Uh, this is not one of them. <laughs> okay, so. so, what do the people in the Blue Zones do? They don't try to damage their body. So, they remove things that damage their body. So, for example, they don't lie there in suntan where there's radiation and damaging your skin cell. They don't smoke, okay? They don't smoke over there because now your body has to repair and it's actually a lot of effort to repair along the way. They are very active. So if I just show you these pictures, these are all of these people in those blue, look at her, like this is doing a handstand. I mean, I, I'm half her age, I can't do the handstand like that. I never was balanced, uh, uh, equipped. This guy's diving into a pool, this guy's doing all this stuff along the way. Lots of community uh, in terms of that. So if you look at their lives and our lives, let's just do a comparison. So over there, they get fresh vegetables. They're farmers, kind of like, right? So they get their activity kind of going out and digging the soil and picking up these very nice fresh vegetables. How do you and I do it? We do it this way, right? Right? So you're fighting in there and you're battling on there, kind of stressful, right? So your body says, oh, stressful. So we look for high fat stuff to buy so we can eat it and then survive our stress, right? Make sense? Um, this is the rushing through the aisles. There's some fruits, but there's a lot of other stuff that's in there, right? Underneath all of that stuff will be the cookies and the Twinkies and all that kind of stuff. My wife bought 50 Twinkies from uh, Costco, okay? And she put it next to my desk, okay? Because that was the storage area. And it was my nephew's wedding and I was getting very nervous about the speech and all that kind of stuff. So I ate all 50 Twinkies. Right? <laughs> I just... <laughs> <laughs> and it made me feel good, right? And then after it went down, I ate another one because it felt so good, <laughs> okay? So that's a problem. How about exercise? So you and I do this, right? We book a time and we go and run on treadmill. We sort of look like that after the treadmill. Actually, many of us look like this after the end of treadmill. <laughs> it looks horrible, right? So how do they do it in the blue zones? The blue zones, they're doing this. They don't exercise. Their exercise is part of their day. Right? They walk around, they do their farming, they fix the fence, they do stuff. So it's not like I'm gonna go exercise, it's part of it, their day. So they're not stressed out, they don't look like they're gonna die or anything like that. Look at her, she's like busy, right? She's like 103 or something like that and she's busy, she's doing farming and pulling out all this green stuff, I don't know what that's for. Look at this, a kneading dough. So the way we make bread is we go to the supermarket. That's how we make bread, right? We just go buy it and that's it. Whereas them, 
they need. They have the older person teaching the younger person, and they're there pushing the bread. So now, by the time you make the bread, you've used a lot of energy just to make the bread. So their daily life is full of activity as well. Look at this guy. This guy's actually making um, um, pasta, right? So the old way of doing it, you just you take the little roll, and then you twist it, and then you stretch, and then you put it again, twist it, and you stretch, and you stretch. And each time you stretch, you're going to actually make all this lovely pasta. So now, all of a sudden, him making pasta is an activity, and then all of a sudden, if he eats it, he's already burnt off a lot of calories, and then he can go and eat some. So then it's all balanced along the way. What about sleep? How many people get eight hours of sleep here? Okay, there's a few hands there. How about seven? Six? Five? Four? Three? Two? Okay, those are the dead people, right? <laughs> So they sleep, uh, when the sun goes down, they sleep, and when the sun rises, they wake up, right? So they sleep eight to 10 hours, okay? What do we do? We sleep like this, okay, in a bus somewhere. We sleep like this, okay, on our desk and stuff like that. Like, imagine that you sleep like this. It means you're so exhausted that your brain shuts off and you have to fall asleep in that fashion along the way. And this one's fun in, in Japan, right? Just so that you don't do the head bopping, they have a hat for you that, uh, and I'm not sure what this is says. It's probably do not disturb in Japanese, okay? I like this one. This is the Canadian version, right? Yeah, this is the Canadian version. Uh, we're not quite as equipped, but it's a Burberry scarf, so it's an expensive guy anyways. How do we eat? Okay, this is how we eat, right? Rushed and all that stuff. How do we make our kids eat? They're rushed as well, okay? So therefore, we're constantly in a rush. How do we eat in the car, coffee, cell phone, trying to drive? What do you think your body's signaling right now in your head? Is it signaling life is great, you don't have to worry, no need to hoard calories, everything is available? Or is it signaling, oh my God, there's a disaster, there's a disaster, hang on to the fat, hang on to the food, eat whatever you can because there may not be any more food in the future, okay? What about that? That seems very typical, right? So what is the hormone system doing in these two people, right? Now you look over in the blue zone areas, this is what they're doing, very old people cooking. You know, making all these lovely, tasty foods in slow temperature cooking, right? Not deep frying, this is slow cooking kind of stuff. And they're, look at this, they're all friends. They're all getting together to eat. And look at them, you know, nine billion years old, and they're laughing, they're telling stories, and they're having a good time, okay? Difference, right? Huge difference along the way. I like this one. Uh, your husband is suffering from a very severe stress disorder. If you do not do the following, he will surely die. Each morning, make him a very healthy breakfast. Be pleasant to him at all times. For lunch, make him a, nutri a nutritious meal. For dinner, prepare an especially nice meal. No chores, no nagging, oh yes, and make love several times a week. Do this for the next year, and he will regain his health completely. <laughs> so then, on their way out, it says, what did the doctor say? You're gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, the good news, <laughs> the good news is that, remember the blue zone thing? Okay, so there were a couple of cities in the United States that said, we want to do the blue zone thing. So, there's a lot of good books and bad books, okay? So, there's some that they just want to sell you stuff, so avoid those ones. But the good ones actually teach you what you should do in your community, the exercise and eating, the community. So, they started creating in, uh, I think it was... Uh, um, these small towns in Iowa and Minnesota, the mayors got involved because they were very sick. They, uh, there was one mayor that had kidney problems and stuff like that. So he took on this thing for the whole town and the whole town did this. So they would walk together, they would have a little park that they planted vegetables and they kind of looked after this vegetable plot and then they would eat the vegetables and things like that. In a crazy United States area, so they did this. And what they noticed is that there was 40% reduction in healthcare claims over the three years and that basically there were less people reporting calling in sick. And what they think they've done is they've extended life expectancy by about three years by doing all of these things along the way. So in other words, the Blue Zone stuff is nothing special to Japan or Greece or whatever. You can actually replicate those same things here. And Dr. Pandey and his whole team would be perfect for one of those Blue Zones. And you could be designated a Blue Zone city. Um, you get these little logos, you get t-shirts and all that kind of stuff, and everybody participates and actually you can change the course of heart disease in thousands and thousands of people along the way. Anyway, that's enough talking for me, so hopefully I didn't put you to sleep too much. Um, thank you for staying awake, and I wish you a, a great rest of the conference as well. You are fantastic. You're doing fantastic.
Thank you so much, Peter. As last year, Peter is just fabulous. He's such a good speaker and, and very complex ideas that he can bring down and that even a simpleton like me can understand. So, Peter, thank you so much. So, we've got our challenge. We are going to be a designated blue zone city five years. Remember, we started with the SMART goals. It's got to be time. Five years, Cambridge needs to be a blue zone. That's our target. We're going to bring Peter back, and he's going to prove to us that we did it. I want to, I want to cut the ribbon, you know, and say blue zone. <laughs> It'll be a blue ribbon next time. This time it was a red ribbon, so we'll have a blue ribbon for the cutting next time. So we've got a few minutes for questions. I know we've uh, been enthralled, and there's lots of questions here. We won't be able to get to all of them. We have mics roving around. The, the guys are also have uh, little cards that they can uh, bring to you, but I'm going to start off. Um, so Peter, uh, obviously a very spectacular presentation as always. I always so enjoy uh, learning from you. Question for you. Uh, if I eat a relatively balanced diet, do I still require dietary supplements? How do supplements affect the aging process? What's your take on supplements? Yeah, so the supplements, unfortunately, hasn't done as well. So when we try it in trials where we feed people vitamins and things like that, it hasn't really worked out as well. If you eat a perfectly balanced meal, um, you should have all the vitamins and minerals and all the stuff that you need. The one that we probably all are missing is vitamin D. So that's the one that I will say, you know, if you want to do anything, vitamin D probably, because we don't have a whole lot of sunshine. So the way we were built is that we were supposed to be outdoor creatures, right? And we can make vitamin D in about 15 minutes of exposure of our back, for example. So we can actually make enough vitamin D in 15 minutes for the day. And what happens is that your body's so smart if you're out there for longer, let's say you're working, you're out there for longer, any extra vitamin D, it'll break down. So you never get too much. It always fills you up, and then any extra that it makes, it'll just break down so that you're always just at the right amount. Um, the problem that came in is that because we're so efficient at vitamin D production, there's no food source or very few food sources with vitamin D because nature sort of thought you can make your own. So that's why it's very hard for us to find vitamin D, and then if we don't have the sunshine, that's why we have deficiency in D. It got to the point where the government said, please don't measure any more vitamin D because everybody's coming back low. So instead of measuring it, just replace it uh, along the way. So D might be the one that probably has the most information around. The other ones all have patchy, um, so like zinc and all those other things. But for sure, the D one probably has the most uh, surrounding it. Thank you, Peter. I, I couldn't agree more. You know, so uh, I, I know you would probably agree with us, Peter, but you know, the studies that have been done, and I'm always amazed by that, you know, we go through these fads of you know, you know, selenium and zinc and blah, blah, blah. And, and when, you know, I'm always impressed by the idea that, that if you get the, food, you know, the, the nutrients from food, they seem to be beneficial. But when we put it into a little capsule, you know, it is either just a waste of money and we're just peeing it in the toilet, uh, or potentially harmful. And you know, one of the things that, that I wonder about, for example, with calcium, you know, um, th there's this concern around the calcium supplements versus natural calcium, and some people need it for, for if they have osteoporosis. But one of the, the things that, that, you know, is, that sort of sticks out to me is that perhaps when you take it in a capsule form, you're just getting too much too quickly. Right. And so rather than getting into all of the cells, because their metabolism won't allow for it to be absorbed in the right cells at the right time, it's going into where it you know, can get in fastest, perhaps into your blood vessels and calcifying them or into other things that may be more harmful. What are your thoughts about if we get the same nutrients from foods versus yeah. putting it into a capsule? So very, very much along that same lines is that if you take a pill, then you get an absorption of calcium that's a spike. Whereas if you, uh, like an Asian person, the way we got calcium, we couldn't drink milk, right? Because lactose intolerant, it was very disastrous. Um, uh, what we would do is my mother would boil every animal that she could find into a soup. And from the bones that you leached out the calcium, and therefore you were getting calcium in that fashion. And therefore you can imagine that a soup is a lower concentration, so you're not getting hit as hard. The second thing is, let's say um, vitamin C, for example, you could take that in a pill, or you can eat an orange. Now, none of us are going to think that the vitamin C pill is the same as an orange. The orange has vitamin C plus a lot of other stuff that's balanced inside the orange. So when you eat the orange, you're getting vitamin C but balanced with everything else. So it's kind of like when you're cooking, right? So sugar's good, but you can't just have sugar. You know, pepper is good, but you just can't have pepper. You sort of need it in a balance. And so in the whole foods that we're eating, you're going to have that balance automatically. When you take pills, it is not balanced, right? We're going to get a huge amount of this, not enough of this. So that's why eating the whole foods is such a, you know, important thing for us to do. Excellent. We're going to take a few more questions. Um, 
So remember, guys, I need uh, people to fill out the evaluation forms. Peter always does a spectacular job, and his evaluations last year were very strong. I need, I need to know what, do we, when we bring Peter back, what would you like him to talk about? He can talk about practically anything in the world. So, uh, so uh, you know, I always want feedback from you guys. What are the things that Peter should address and, and all of our speakers in future should address? Question for you, Peter. Uh, uh, interesting question, actually. Uh, what do you think about, how does stress affect your diet and metabolism? Does it slow down when you're stressed? And this person says that they gain weight when they're under stress. How does stress affect the, how our body handles calories and metabolism? Yeah, so there's, if you look at animals, right? So let's say you look at a little um, a mouse, for example. When it's stressed, it's shaky and twitchy and all that kind of stuff, right? So if you're a little more like a mouse, then when you're stressed out, you tend to lose weight, right? Because your body is kind of burning extra calories. For most of us, when you're stressed out, what you end up doing is your brain does this. Stress in nature, long-term stress, um, has always been about no food, okay? So short-term stress is T-Rex is trying to eat me, I have to run away, okay? That's short-term stress. Long-term stress, there is no long-term stress model in nature except famine. So during famine is when you have stress because you're looking for food to try and stay alive. So that's why when you get stressed because you have no money for the mortgage or your boss is an idiot or whatever, then basically your brainstem kicks in and says, you're under chronic stress, so therefore you must be in a famine. If you eat food, that gets rid of the stress because if I can find food, there's no more famine and then it's okay. So that's why you'll tend to gravitate towards foods, eating a lot of it, and you'll tend to gravitate towards high calorie foods, lots of sugar foods, lots of salt, because those are the things that will keep you alive in a famine situation. I need sugar, I need salt, I need fat. And that's why you will gravitate towards that. And that's why a lot of people say, I'm doing my emotional eating. Because I thought it was really weird. Like every race will say that they're eating because of their stress. How could it po be possible that every race has adapted eating as a way to cope with stress? So it can't be a, a, a sort of a psychological thing. It must be a biological thing that your brain says stress equals famine. If you find food, it gets rid of the stress. And that's what you do. And the problem is when you eat the food, the stress is still there, right? Your boss is still an idiot and so on and so forth, right? So therefore, the stress is still there. So what does your brain says? Eat more food to get rid of this. Eat more food. because So this is the alarm clock that keeps going, the alarm signal that keeps going. And that's why people gain so much weight. The way to stop that is to say, I'm not an animal. I don't have to eat food because I'm not lacking food. It's my stupid boss. And then therefore, you won't turn to the food. Actually, and we will be addressing all of us together very shortly. Mike Chapman from Breathe Into Yoga Motion will be uh, leading us on a, a brief journey through yoga and hopefully uh, reducing some of our stress levels. So, Mike, looking forward to you guys starting up. We're going to take a couple of more questions. We have a question by the mic down there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That was an excellent presentation, very informative. I appreciate it very much. I do have a question, though, and it's uh, we've been taught not to eat saturated fats. And it's really, you know, and now that trend seems to be changing. Saturated fats are now good for you because of that long chain, double bonds, it's a little bit confusing. So, and I put that down as a, on my evaluation sheet, maybe that would be another good topic for next year, because it's really, I'm, I was getting very confused, like eat saturated fats, don't eat saturated, right. what types of saturated sure. fat? We've, we've covered the trans fat pretty good, they're, they're gone. Right. But, I'm hearing now saturated fats are good for you. You should be eating. It's good for your heart. So I'm, I'm, I'm confused. And we're, we're equally confused because <laughs> the original studies focused on saturated fat. It is bad. So as doctors, we told everybody saturated fat, butter is bad. Butter is bad. Then all of a sudden they figured out the trans fat story. Oh, trans fat is worse. So then they said get rid of trans fat. So now what they're saying is the following. What you eat here there's a complicated path before it goes into your heart and clogs up the artery. So we're now understanding there's a whole bunch of steps that go from eating this, it's gotta go through your gut, those bacteria, then it's gotta go through your bloodstream, through your liver, and then what is your liver doing to it, and then we have deposit. So that's why they said when we look back at all the people that are eating saturated fat, not every single person eating saturated fat ended up with a heart attack. And so that's when they said, okay, we're not so sure because there's a bunch of steps in between. However, having said that, what they're now saying is let's reduce that. So that's why they said reduce sugar, reduce salt, and reduce fat. So in other words, they're saying we should still be careful. So don't say butter is fantastic, 
But if you want a little bit of it, it's not bad. It's not like the evil Darth Vader anymore. And so you can have some of it. But if you're of the type of person that blobs the butter on the bread and stuff like that, let's reduce that because I think that is gonna get you into trouble. Polyunsaturated, meaning many unsaturated, many double bonds, those are the oils. So typically we said that the oils tend to be better for your system, uh, but then unfortunately you can't make a cookie out of it, so if you love cookies and you love bakery, you're still gonna be using the butters, the saturated fats along the way. So just reduce the amount. So enjoy it, and the way to enjoy food is on the back of your tongue. Once you swallow, there is no flavor, there are no taste buds here. Okay, then it's just calories, okay? I had one lady, it was very funny, she eats chocolate like this, you know those big milky bar thing? She goes like this. <laughs> and I said, why do you eat it like a machine? She goes, oh, it tastes so good. But I said, it's not even touching your taste, but, but that's the thing, it touches and then it's so good and then I gotta get more and stuff like that. So we taught her to just break a piece off and then just let it melt on the back of her tongue. So all of a sudden she goes, oh, that's very good. So then her brain thinks that she had like two chocolate bars because it, it melted for so long and then she was satisfied. The other trick is chewing your food slowly. We talk to these people with the lap band, you know, where they put the collar on your stomach and then it makes you feel full and stuff like that. And I asked them, I said, you know, what made you lose weight? And I, I thought they were gonna say the $15,000 collar. They didn't say that. They said, we chew our food very slowly and we make sure that it doesn't get stuck. And they said, when you chew slowly, you don't eat as much, right? Because the volume is reduced. And number two is when you chew slowly, your brain has a chance to say, I had a really good burger. Right? So in other words, your brain has a chance to say, I had a really good meal, and therefore I don't need food anymore. Whereas you and I do this, and then your brain goes, I'm not sure if you ate, but just in case, just in case, we'll sit down again, okay, and eat, because if you don't eat, you're gonna die, and I don't remember if food came in because it was pretty quick. So therefore, take a bit of time and chew your food a little slower, and that helps you uh, with uh, feeling satisfied. Thank you so much, uh, We're gonna take a couple more questions from here. We've got a question at the back first. Dr. Lin, um, you spoke about the blue zones. Um, one of the things that I'd like you to talk some more about the demeanor of the people in the blue zones, okay. their joy, their happiness, yeah. their, their easy way of right. living. If you can talk some more about that, we'll appreciate sure. it. Yeah, so they were looking for what is the same between all these blue zones. And by the way, the way, reason why they're called blue zone is when the National Geographic went to look for them, they put them on a map and they circled them with a blue marker. <laughs> that was the only reason. <laughs> like I was thinking, why blue zone, not green zone? Anyway, blue zone. So the blue zone people, you're absolutely right. So they found some commonalities, okay? So these are the list of commonalities that I was trying to show you. They don't do stuff that harm their body. So no smoking, no sun tanning, that kind of stuff. They tend to um, eat, uh, eat plant-based mainly plant-based, so not a lot of heavy meats. They tend to cook at low temperatures, not the high temperature cooking that they have. And then in terms of connectivity, their exercise is part of their day. And then finally, they're always part of a social network. So they're never alone. So in Japan, they have these, uh, I, I can't remember what the Japanese word is, but you're assigned a person, and that person is like your mentor for your whole life. So if you have troubles, you talk to your mentor, you wanna, you know, you're lonely, you go and talk to your mentor. So they have a connection between each person, and that has been huge. Whereas what do we do here, right? Ah, you're getting old, let's put you into a nursing home, and we're gonna be nice to you and put you in a ward of four people where they don't talk to you and you don't interact with them, right? That's, that's not a good strategy. Whereas over there, the elderly are part of the system, right? So they're part of that um, community. And just like you guys have a, that's why you guys would be perfect, right? Because you're already a community, you're already working together and therefore um, that would be very easy for this one to get the demeanor that you were talking about. Whereas you come to Toronto, people say, oh, I don't want to sit next to you. Okay, that kind of thing, right? So it's different, right? Whereas here, there's a sense that, you know, we all want to help each other and we want to belong. So that demeanor is already in existence here through these programs. And that's why I think you guys would be just a perfect place for a blue zone. Challenge is on. Five years, that's our challenge for the smart goal. You know, it's funny, Peter, you bring that up. I, I grew up in Nova Scotia in, in Cape Breton. And, and it is, again, like Cambridge, it's a very small community. Everybody knows everybody. And even if you don't know them, you, you know, you just, you're walking down the street, you talk to everybody. And I remember, you know, you went to med school at U of T. I remember when I moved from Nova Scotia to Toronto, and I think I've told you the story. Uh, I moved a few days early, because I didn't know Toronto, and, you know, small town boy going to a big city, didn't want to be lost. And so, you know, I figured, you know what, I'm gonna dr just ride the subway, just kind of get a lay of the land and figure out where things are at. 
So, you know, middle of the afternoon, I'm in the subway, there's nobody in the subway, usually the subway's packed. There's this huge, you know, compartment that there's me and there's one other guy. And, you know, I'm sitting here, he's sitting across from me, right? Small town boy from Cape Breton, if you're gonna sit with somebody for more than about 10 seconds, you're gonna talk to them, right? And so, you know, I just, just completely assume that's what normal people do. And so, you know, I just start talking to this guy, right? And, and just, how's it going? Where are you off to? What you up to? You know, just normal conversation that people would have. And this guy must have thought that I was either a psychopath or I was gonna murder him or something. Cause, you know, the next stop, he gets up, gets out of the compartment and goes into the next compartment. He still is riding the subway. He just didn't want to sit with me because I was talking to him. So, you know, it comes that's down it, to the it. social connectedness that I think it, it is key, right? I think, you know, we live in communities that sometimes isolate us and uh, we need to find ways of bringing us all back together. We're gonna finish up, I know we've got lots of questions and, and Peter has been very grateful, uh, gra gra gracious for, for fielding it. One question for you that, that's come up in a few different versions uh, we're gonna end with. Um, People have asked, you, know, you talked about the fact that you know, our response to, to stress and, uh, is, is sort of innate by the idea that stress historically might have been because uh, as a species we didn't have as much food and you'd go through periods of fast and famine and then you know, if you had access to food you'd react by eating a lot to store up calories. And, and so in some ways our stress response is, is a survival response. So if that's the case, should we fast for, to replicate how humans lived previously? Should we go through periods where we you know, don't eat for a day or don't eat for an extended period of time to, to rev up our mind? Sure. What are your thoughts about fasting? Because that's yeah, kind of better there, there, are, there are a lot of people that say that we should probably fast uh, once in a while. And I would say we have now evolved from those days that our body cannot adapt to a lot of fasting right away. Okay, so if you wanna do a little fasting, I don't mind. But don't try and do the true fasting where like every week you have two or three days where you're not eating because your body was never, uh, it's, it's now evolved to the point that you can't adapt. So for example, uh, right now if I threw you out in the middle of winter with no clothes on, like you, you can't adapt to that fast enough, right? Because we've now grown to the fact that we need central heating, you know, we need Netflix and stuff like that, right? Like you will never survive, right? So the problem is that it, we've, we've now evolved to the point where We've got some of the primitive stuff still kicking in, but some of the protective primitive things that we had is not there. For example, the amount of brown fat that we have is reduced. And brown fat, it's brown because, you know, those mitochondria, the power stations in the cell, you have more of them there. And what brown fat does is like a heater. So it takes fat and it makes heat, okay? So therefore, we don't have a lot of brown fat. So if I throw you out in the wintertime, you, you can't generate enough heat to keep yourself warm. Whereas your dogs are fine, right? They're walking around, they don't need no parka or Canada goose around them or anything like that, right? They're walking around fine in the wintertime. So they have still maintained that adaptation. So that's why if you wanna try and reduce calories, I don't mind, but when people start saying, I wanna stop eating for the whole weekend or something crazy like that, because then all of a sudden you're burning fat and sometimes you're burning a lot of fat and some of the chemicals that are in our fat will come back out. So when we've been eating all the foods and things like that, there are some fat-soluble chemicals that will get stored into our fat. Slowly, it's been storing in there. If I rapidly drop your weight, now the fat comes out, and any of the chemicals that were stored in the fat will also move out, okay? So that's not good, because now we have years and years of accumulated chemicals now coming out all at once, and that's not good for your system, okay, either. So that's why we don't like these dramatic weight loss, you know, like they say, we will make you lose 10 pounds in like uh, one week. We're very afraid of that. Two things, either you're just losing water, that's one way to make you feel good, right? We make you lose water, but that's not what you wanna lose. Or we do make you lose the fat, but then now all of a sudden these chemicals will come out in, in, on mass, and then you don't feel good. So that's why if you go slowly, I think that would be better. If you wanna reduce the amount of food that you're eating, that's okay, if you wanna skip a meal, and if you're gonna skip a meal, which meal should you skip? Dinner. Which one? Yeah, dinner, right? So breakfast, you haven't eaten all night long, so you need to replenish. Lunch, you're still active, so therefore whatever you eat will get burnt off. Dinner is the one that if you have a big dinner, what'll happen is your body says, he's not doing nothing. I, what am I gonna do with all this extra energy? I'll store it in a GIC, okay, for him, okay? <laughs> that's a GIC right there, okay. So that's known as the sumo wrestler diet. Like they are, <laughs> they are told after a high fat meal at dinner, they cannot move. 
You're not allowed to move. You got to go to sleep. And that way, all that energy that comes in goes, okay, I have nowhere to go, so I'm going to go store it in terms of fat. So don't have the sumo wrestler diet. But that's what we all do, right? In the morning, non, no time for breakfast, no time for lunch because I'm busy at work. Okay, I'll have a big dinner at nighttime and then I'll sleep. So that's the sumo wrestler diet. So if you want to look like a sumo wrestler, then eat that way, okay? So, okay? So at this point, we're going to, there's lots of questions for Peter. He's such a spectacular speaker. Huge round of applause for Peter. Let him know that we want him back again next year, Peter. Thank you so much. I greatly appreciate the time. And the challenge is on. Five years, Peter's going to be cutting the ribbon, the blue ribbon.